Hi, everyone. My name is John. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, mutation testing. I'm the CTO at a small tech company in Palo Alto called Cognito. Uh, and sorry if there's a little flickering here. We're not sure what's going on, but all right. Uh, so before I get into it, I want to give you a quick outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to give you an introduction to what mutation testing is. I'm going to show you how it can help you improve test coverage. Then I'm going to show you how it can uh, teach you more about Ruby and the code that you rely on. I'm going to show you how it can be an X-ray for legacy code, how it can be a great tool for detecting dead code, how it can be probably the most thorough measure of test coverage, how it can help simplify code, then I'm going to wrap it up by talking about the practicality of mutation testing day to day and how you can incorporate it uh, at your job. So before we talk about mutation coverage, we need to be on the same page for line coverage or test coverage in general. Usually when we're talking about test coverage, we mean line coverage. So line coverage roughly means uh, the number of lines of code run by your tests over the total lines of code in the project. There's different variations like branch coverage, but that's sort of the, the gist of it. Mutation testing asks a different question. It says, uh, how much of your code can I change without failing your tests? Uh, and if you think about it, that makes sense. Uh, if I can remove a line of code or meaningfully modify a line of code in your project uh, without breaking your tests, then something's probably wrong. You're either missing a test or that's dead code. So before we actually uh, dive into how to automatically, you know, with a tool, do mutation testing, I want to give you a good intuition of uh, what mutation testing is by doing it by hand. So I've got uh, some sample code here. You can take a second to read it over. So I've got this class called gluttons at, at the top. Uh, I just initialize it with a Twitter client, then I do a search on the Twitter API using that client, uh, and then I get the first two results, grab the author from it, and return that. And that's basically what the test specifies down here. It's got a uh, fake client and then some fake tweets. All right, on the left here, I've got uh, the same code, but in sublime text on the left, and then on the right, I've got a script that's going to run whenever I modify the file. Uh, that script is going to output a diff of the code against the current output, or the, the current uh, code in Sublime Text, as well as uh, the result of running the tests. So first, I'm going to go in and try to modify the hashtag. That does not fail the test. I can also remove the search string entirely, and that doesn't fail it. And I can actually call it with zero arguments, and that also does not fail the test. If I change first two to first one, that does fail the test. That's good. But if I change it to first three, that does not fail the test. All right, so going over those again, I can basically change the input to the search method however I want. I can remove the hashtag, remove the entire search string, call it with a different number of arguments, doesn't matter. If I change the first two to first one, that does fail it. That's because we're giving us uh, two fake tweets in our fake client. But if I change it to first three, then that does not fail the test. And that's because we only have two fake tweets in our test. So that's manual mutation testing. Uh, you can imagine that doing that actually day to day at your job would be pretty tedious. Uh, you know, if you're, this is just one method, but if we're adding 100 lines of code, trying to do this for every single part of the, uh, the code that we're adding would be uh, a lot of wasted time. And it's also going to be pretty hard to outsmart yourself. If you just did the best job you can uh, writing this code and writing the test for it, then it's going to be hard to then, 30 seconds later, come up with things you didn't think of before. All right, now I'm going to show you how to do mutation testing with an automated tool. Uh, there's uh, 
The main tool for this is called Mutants. It's been around for years. Uh, I learned about it about two years ago, and it's how I got into mutation testing. Uh, and I've since then become a, a large contributor to the project. A friend and I also just started a fork of this project recently called Mutest. Uh, that is pre pretty similar right now, and you'll notice throughout the presentation I'll probably refer to them interchangeably. But you can use it, either one. All right, so in this example here, I'm uh, invoking the mutant uh, command line argument, or the command line uh, program, and passing in the, uh, a flag saying to use the RSpec integration, and I'm telling it to mutate uh, the class that we just saw. There's gonna be a lot of noise in this output, so don't worry about it. We'll go over all the uh, results again. All right, each diff here is a mutation that it found after, while running my test. So it found some things that we also found during our manual mutation testing run. It can remove the entire argument and it doesn't matter. It also pointed out that we can pass in a different type of uh, variable to the search. We can also pass in nil, which is interesting. Something that we didn't catch in our manual run is it can change first two to last two. And if this is the recent method that finds the most recent uh, tweets, then this is probably a pretty bad change. If we care about finding the most recent tweets, then uh, we probably don't want to return the oldest ones. You can also remove the first two call entirely, which is interesting. We probably wanted to specify that behavior too, because if we ship this code to production and didn't have this code in there, you could see how we could possibly quickly exhaust our uh, API token and rate limit ourselves. So in this case, our mutation testing tool shows us how to improve the test. We give it three fake tweets instead of two, uh, and we also explicitly specify the search that we expect it to uh, perform. So when we use uh, mutest, test, it's automated, it's quick, and we don't have to think or expend much more effort and it's probably gonna be more clever than you too. Uh, Mutant has been accruing different uh, mutations for years uh, that all target very specific use cases and try to point out uh, specific changes uh, depending on the code that it's interacting with. So here's another example. In this case, I'd like you to imagine that you're working on an internal API. Here's some sample code, I'll give you a second to read it. So here we have the user's controller, and we've got the show action. We're taking in the ID parameter, making sure that it's an integer, passing it to the user finder, and uh, either rendering JSON for what we found or uh, rendering an error, and that's pretty much what the test below is specifying. If we run this through our mutation testing tool, it's gonna show us that it can replace the uh, 2i method with the uppercase integer method. And that's actually pretty interesting. Uh, if you're not familiar with the difference, the 2i method will work on any string and on nil. If I don't have any integers or any digits in my string, it's still gonna give me zero. If we call it on nil, it's gonna give me zero. The integer method's gonna raise an error if I give it nil, and it's going to raise an error if it can't uh, get a number out of the string. It's also, also gonna change the uh, hash bracket method there to hash fetch, uh, and the difference there is it's a little bit more strict on the presence of the key. So uh, in the original implementation, if the ID key was not there, this would silently return nil. Now in this code, it's gonna raise an error if that key isn't there. So if we put those together, our tool is uh, forcing us to write a slightly more strict implementation of this action. It's saying uh, assert the presence of the key, assert the, that uh, the ID value is actually uh, parsable as an integer. And uh, this has some interesting implications too. We're modeling our problem a little bit better. For example, before, if someone uh, used the API incorrectly and passed in something, or did not pass in the ID key, then we would try to get the ID, we could nil, we could coerce it to zero, pass that to the finder, and then return the user an error saying, could not find the user with ID zero. Uh, so this is a, a bit more of a, uh, 
well-fitted uh, implementation for this problem, and uh, we're also being forced to think about things like not performing extraneous uh, database queries instead of uh, doing validation ahead of time. Here's another small example. In this case, we've got a uh, created after action. I'll let you read it over real quick. Cool. So in this case, we're passing in a parameter called after. It's going to parse that input and then pass it to a class method on the user called recent. If we run this through a mutest, it's going to show us that we can actually replace parse with a method called ISO 8601. If we're not familiar with the difference, that's okay. It's a pretty poorly named method. <laughs> but basically, it's a more strict parsing uh, method. Specifically, it specifies there's going to be four uh, digits for the year, a dash, two digits for the month, dash, two digits for the day. And this is pretty significant compared to the uh, parsing rules for date.parse. It's basically going to try to do uh, anything it can to parse the input. It's going to support all these different formats, as well as some that we might not want to parse. If it finds the name of a month inside of the in input, then it's going to try to parse that. So on the left, we've got every valid input now for May 1st, 2017. On the right, we have uh, all the different inputs that can produce May 1st, 2017. Uh, now we're going to talk about regular expressions. I'm particularly excited about this part of the presentation because this is uh, a feature that I think no other tool in the Ruby ecosystem can really help you with. Uh, and uh, Mutant and Mutest can uh, actually dig into a regular expression and show you uh, that you're not covering branches within it, which is pretty cool. So here's some uh, sample code. Basically here, we are iterating over a uh, list of usernames, presumably an array of strings, and we're selecting the ones that match this, this regular expression. The first thing we're going to see here is it's going to try to replace the caret and the dollar sign with backslash uppercase A and backslash Z. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the difference, the caret and the dollar sign mean beginning and end of a line, whereas the backslash uppercase A and backslash Z mean beginning and end of string. Uh, so in the first case, I could pass in uh, Alice, new line, John, new line, Bob, and it would match. And so it's showing us in this case, hey, you don't provide any test input that shows that you want to handle these multi-line strings. So I can actually change this to uh, the more strict format, and that's what works. It's also going to try to remove each uh, value in the alternation and uh, make sure that we're actually testing each conditional. Because inside the regular expression, we're actually saying John or Alan are both valid matches. So we should be testing both cases. It's also going to try to put a question mark uh, colon at the beginning of the string. Uh, and that means that it's changing it to a passive capture group. Basically, parentheses and regular expressions serve multiple purposes. It can both be a mechanism for uh, grouping expressions, like here, where we have the pipe, we're saying John or Alan, but it also means uh, that uh, we want to extract this value and uh, preserve it in the match data. So in this case, the uh, question mark colon means uh, we don't care about extracting this value, we're just grouping. And so in this case, it's recommending that we uh, either test that we're capturing something or uh, use this more intention-revealing syntax. Then finally, if we're running this on Ruby 2.4, it's going to say, hey, I can use the new match predicate method. And if you're not familiar with the difference, uh, this method is new in Ruby 2.4, and it's about three times faster. It only returns uh, true or false, and the way it's faster is it doesn't do anything with uh, global variables whereas every other regular expression method will actually set variables regardless of whether you want them. And if we put all these together, we get something that is more strict in the input, better tested, more intention revealing with the passive capture group, and more performant. And the cool thing here is that we didn't have to know about any of these features in Ruby in order to write this method. We wrote what we knew, and then the tool recommended all these changes, which resulted in a pretty different method, but better fitted for our task. 
All right, now I'd like to uh, talk about HTTP clients. Here we've got a method called stars4, and it's using the uh, popular HTTP party uh, client. It's going to take in a uh, repository name, uh, hit the GitHub API, turn the result into a hash, and then get the key under the stargazer's account. We run this through our mutation testing tool. We're going to see that it can. Uh, we're going to see that it can remove the 2H method, uh, and everything still works. Now this might seem a little confusing at first, but what's going on here is uh, the HTTP party client actually will look at the content type response header and behave like a hash uh, if the response is JSON, and. Uh, as a result, we can actually remove that 2H method and interact with the response ob object, object just like we were before, uh, and it works the same. And the cool thing here is that uh, Mutest does not have any uh, like specific HTTP, HTTP party uh, like support within it. It just knows how to walk through your method definition and remove different methods. Uh, and so as a result, even if we didn't know this before, we're gonna see this mutation, read the documentation, and update our code. And we learn a little bit more in the process. All right, now I'd like to talk about legacy code. This is the same code example we had before, uh, the created after endpoint where we're passing a date. In this case, I'd like you to imagine that instead of uh, implementing this method yourself, you're being tasked with updating the method. Uh, maybe adding a new feature. And to make this more realistic, let's say that the original author wrote it two years ago, there isn't much documentation, there's only a few tests, and uh, they no longer work at this company. When you run your mutation testing tool on this code before you actually modify it, you're gonna see this mutation to ISO 8601. And if you don't know about it then, you're going to probably look up the documentation and see what the difference is. Huh. This is a more strict date parsing format. Interesting. This leads, to, this leads to us asking a few questions about the code in question. What was the author's intent here? Did they mean for people to only use this very strict format? Or did they mean uh, for people to be able to use any format and they just didn't add tests for that? More importantly, how is this code actually being used today? If there are other services that are passing in other formats here, we probably want to actually update the test to reflect that we support this. We don't want to break their, their integration. And so running our mutation testing tool on this code before we modify it is giving us a uh, checklist, basically, of things or questions that we should answer before we modify it. Uh, in other words, it's basically giving us sort of a like, list of hotspots where if we modify this part of the code, we might actually uh, introduce a regression and the test won't fail. This probably isn't too surprising, but mutation testing can be a very thorough uh, way to measure test coverage. Consider this method right here. If we invoke this method at all within our uh, program, then uh, a line coverage tool is going to say that we have 100% coverage. But even if we test it correctly, we are still uh, probably not testing it in the ideal way. Our mutation testing tool is gonna show us that it can actually fiddle with the boundaries here and say, hey, are you actually testing for the off by one errors here? It's gonna say, do you have a test specifying that 21 is the minimum age for buying alcohol and that 20 is rejected, 22 is allowed? And by fiddling with this boundary, it's actually helping us improve our test. And this very thorough modification of the code uh, can be a very big help when we're uh, dealing with very complex methods that seem pretty simple. This is only a nine line method here. But in this case, uh, we're dealing with a lot of complexity. Basically, we have a method here that's deciding whether a given user in a system called an editor here can edit a given post. We've got some different user roles here. By modifying each line of this code, each individual token is actually going to ask us, are you testing the case where the user is a guest? What about when they're muted? What about when they're a normal user and they are the author of a post? 
What about when that post is locked? Are you testing these conditions together? When the, uh, the editor is the author of the post and when it's locked, same condition, but when it's not locked, when they're not the author and it's locked? What about when they're a moderator? Are you testing the condition where the author is and is not an admin? Are you testing the case where they're an admin? This might seem like a like, large amount of tasks to be writing for this pretty simple method, but the mutation testing tool is pushing us a little bit closer to the actual complexity here. If you think about it, the editor of the post can have five different roles according to this code. The author can have five different roles, and we also have the case where the editor is or is not the user uh, trying to edit the post. And then finally, we have the condition where uh, the post is or is not locked. So we're actually dealing with at least 31 different conditions here. This is a lot of complexity, and our mutation testing tool is at least forcing us to embrace how complex it is and actually prove that uh, we are handling for all these different conditions. Here's another small example. In this case, I'm taking in a list of users, and I'm uh, mapping over them and grabbing their email, and I'm filtering out users that either don't have an email or have previously unsubscribed from our mailing list. This is the sort of code that I would usually write to test uh, what we just saw. In the first example, we've got a valid user and then a user without an email. And then we're asserting that uh, the valid user email is the only thing in the output. Then the second case, we have the same thing. We have a valid user and an unsubscribed user, and we're asserting that only the valid user's email is in the output. Our mutation our, our mutation testing tool is showing us that we can change next to break here. That's pretty interesting, but it makes sense given the uh, test that we wrote. If we look back at them, uh, in each, each case, we have the invalid user, or the user that we're trying to filter out, at the end of our test input. So in this case, skipping one iteration is the same as ending iteration. And so in this case, the way to correct these tests is to put the user that we want to skip at the beginning and have the good user at the end. Uh, this is another small change that the test is able to make to help us improve our tests. Mutation testing is also a great tool for detecting dead code. Consider this example right here. Maybe I'm new to Rails, and I don't know that uh, ActiveRecord is going to do this for me if I have a column called name. Even if I don't know this, if I run the mutation testing tool on it, it's going to show me that I can replace the method body with super. This might seem like a little weird at first. What it's saying is that the entire implementation of this method is already covered by the parent class. So in other words, as a new user to Rails, I didn't have to read any documentation. I didn't have to talk to any coworkers in order to discover that I'm introducing a redundant method. Here's a, another example where I've got a uh, post controller and then a private method called authorized. It's got an optional argument called user, and that's going to default to the current user. If the usage looks like this, then it's going to find one mutation. It's going to say, hey, you're always passing in a user, so we actually don't need this default argument. But if the usage looks like this, it's going to do something different. It's going to try to apply that previous mutation and the test is going to fail because we are calling it with zero arguments. Instead, it's going to say, hey, I can take this assignment and put it at the beginning of the method body. So in other words, no matter what you pass into this, I can overwrite the local variable with the value of current user. In other words, the value of user is static here, and we can actually just inline current user into the method and remove the argument entirely. This is a very small feature that I actually like a lot because I find myself running into it a lot. Maybe I'm doing a refactor and I have this code elsewhere and I had to fully qualify the content that I'm interacting with. But then later I moved it into a method like this and I forgot to update the content. Well, mutest is going to show us that we can replace colon colon my app colon colon with nothing. It's going to remove it. Uh, and we get this for free. It's just going to say, hey, I can actually simplify this content reference and it's the same thing. Here's another small example. In this case, we are passing in an ID parameter to this controller, 
calling the, the post finder, rendering the response, and giving it an HTTP status of 200. The mutation testing tool is going to show us that we can actually uh, remove that status OK entirely. And if we look at the documentation, it makes sense. In this case, the default status code is going to be 200. So again, we're learning a little bit more about what Rails provides for us without actually having to read the documentation or learn from a coworker. Similar to the uh, dead code that I just showed you, mutation testing is also a great resource for uh, simplifying your code. Here's another method that we might have inside of a controller. Basically, we're taking in a user IDs parameter, which is presumably an array of integers, and we're calling the user finder and splatting the input. It's going to say, hey, you don't actually need the splat here. You can just pass in the array, and it behaves the same. So again, we're learning a little bit more about Active Records interface. And it's at basically zero cost. Here we have a user decorator. Uh, at the top, we have an attribute reader for the user. And then the greeting method uh, just returns welcome. And then the name of the user is using the instance variable. The mutation testing tool is going to show us that we can actually replace the user instance variable with the user method. This is a very small change, but I actually like it a lot. Uh, we have the attribute reader, so why not use it? Also, the uh, method call has some nice properties that we don't get with the instance variable. If we type out the instance variable, we're going to sign when we get nil, and then we're going to get a slightly more cryptic error here. But if we type out the method call, we're going to get a slightly more clear error saying that we type out something. Here's another small method where uh, we're passing in a string, which is just a path in the Unix system. We've got the leading, and then we're going to replace the leading tilde with the value of the home environment variable. Running this through mutest is going to show us that we can replace g sub with sub, which makes sense. We don't need a global substitution here. We're doing one substitution, so it's recommending to us that we can use the more intention reviewing and specific method sub, which I'll need as one substitution. Here's another example that I run into fr pretty frequently. Uh, maybe we would have this sort of method uh, if we were a company like Imager, where uh, in a delayed job or something, we are uh, going to regularly look for images that haven't been viewed in the last two years. Then we're going to iterate over them and we'll log a little bit of debug output and then delete all of them and return the count. Well, it's going to show us here we can remove the map with, and replace it with each. And it makes sense. We're not iterating over this input and uh, returning a new array. Uh, so we can just use the normal each method. This is something I run into a lot when I'm refactoring some code where previously uh, I was mapping over the input and returning something new and move it somewhere else, and I forget to change it back to uh, an each. And the nice thing is I don't have to always worry about making these little mistakes. Uh, I know that mutest will catch it for me. Then finally, here's a, uh, another small example where I'm using the Ruby standard library logger, and I am uh, setting a formatter, which is going to take information about a log event and uh, take the different data there, format a string, and then uh, that'll be what's logged to the uh, output stream here. Now, mutest is going to show us that we can actually replace this proc with a lambda. Usually they're pretty similar, so usually I forget what the actual difference is here. But using this very simplified example here, now we've got a proc that takes in two arguments, forms an array, and then inspects that array. Now if we call this the proc version, I can call it with no arguments, uh, one argument, two arguments, three arguments, it doesn't matter. If there's too few arguments, it's going to uh, fill in the arguments with nil. And if there's too many arguments, it's going to silently drop them. And it actually has the same behavior if we pass in an array. It's going to silently splat that array and then behave the same as before. But if we use a lambda, it behaves a little bit more sanely. So you're probably thinking now, uh, for one regular expression, we get five mutations. That seems a little 
ridiculous. I usually open PRs that are hundreds of lines long, and uh, my tests take hours to run. So how can this possibly be practical? Well, there's a few features that uh, make this more manageable. First, it takes in a since flag where you can pass in a git revision. And that basically says, only mutate code that has changed since this uh, git revision. So in this case, if we have two commits, uh, and we specify it's since master, it's only going to select that code that has changed in those two commits. You can also pass in a uh, test selector, which is like this constant name and then uh, a method. And that's saying, you know, and maybe my giant object where I have hundreds of methods, I only change one thing, so I only mutate that. And it also understands our spec conventions. So if you're describing your class and then describing your method, it's actually only going to select uh, for mutation that small method that you're uh, worked with before, and it's only going to select the half dozen tests that actually uh, specify the behavior of that method. So mutation testing, I think, has been one of the most powerful uh, sources of growth for me the last few years. And I think if you're not using mutation testing day to day, it can probably help you grow a lot, too. It helps you learn more about Ruby. There's dozens and dozens of special case mutations that are baked into the tool that only show up when they apply to your current task. Uh, and so you sort of learn about them just in time. Some examples from this presentation are how it changed it parse to ISO 8601, all these different regular expression features, the new feature, the new match feature in Ruby 2.4 from regular expressions, and also the proc and the lambda uh, change. And the generalized changes that it makes, the different removals of you know, lines of code or arguments that you're passing into a method or default arguments, those help you more, learn more about the code that you actually rely on. And you'd be surprised by how frequently this actually results in you learning something new. Some of the examples from this are how we learned about how HTTP, HTTP party uh, behaves differently if the content type is application JSON, as well as all the different uh, behaviors that we see from uh, different Rails methods, things like the controller behavior with the default status code and Active Records uh, interface. And the net result here is not just that you learn more, I think you also learn a little bit faster. At least that's what I've found. Whenever you do work, whenever you do a refactor or add code, you're going to also be learning a little bit more about Ruby on average and learning a little bit more about the code you interact with. So this is sort of an amplifying effect, I think. And it's obviously going to uh, improve your testing skills. You're going to start thinking more about uh, what are all the different branches that uh, happen here, and uh, what actually is the uh, expected behavior of this feature that I'm adding. I think the net result here is you end up modeling your uh, understanding of the code a little bit better, and you end up shipping fewer bugs. You're understanding what tests are still not uh, doing anything or what, what test cases are not being tested. You're removing dead code. You're removing uh, unnecessary code. You're using more simple uh, methods within Ruby. And if you do this uh, mutation testing on code before you modify it and you're unfamiliar with it, you're probably going to introduce fewer regressions, too. Uh, as I mentioned before, you're going to get sort of a like, list of hotspots from the application that uh, are likely to allow you to break the code without failing the tests. They'll only show up in production. And it gives you this sort of checklist of, like, before I change this, I need to understand, is someone supposed to only pass in this date format, or are people now using it in different ways? It results in writing simpler code, similar to the dead code detection that I mentioned before. You're going to be surprised by you know, removing a few lines here simplifying the, a method call here using a simpler uh, Ruby method over there, that comes together as dramatically simpler code. And it's not much effort for you to uh, arrive at that after writing the initial implementation. So I hope at least some of you are excited to use mutation testing on the job now. If your coworkers are not excited about uh, using it as a team, you can still use mutest before you push.
Uh, if you do so, you're probably going to learn a little bit more about Ruby, a little bit more about the code you depend on. You're going to write better tests, and you're probably going to grow a little bit faster than your coworkers. And if you are a team lead, you should consider adding mute tests to, to your CI. Uh, you don't have to aim for 100% mutation coverage in order to benefit here. Just being able to see uh, what code can I change here without failing the test is a powerful tool for both the author and the code reviewer. Uh, for the author, it, it lets them sort of review themselves and, and ask, should I change anything else here before I ship this? And for the code reviewer, they don't have to deeply understand the tests and the code involved like as much in order to understand, is this safe to go to production? They can at least look at CI and, and think, is this, uh, like what modifi modifications can we make here? Uh, if there are a bunch, maybe we should add some more tests. If you like what you saw here today, and you love writing great code, you should email us, jobs at cognitohq.com. And I hope that you all are excited about using mutation testing. Thanks. <laughs>